Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CFC. Welcome home, in a sense, to worship with the Lord and with our family. Um, today, I get a, I get the a privilege and the blessing to introduce a, a friend, a, kind of a new friend, but I've I've kind of known Pastor JP for a while in random ways and random connections, but gotten to know him recently much better. And it's um, let me do a quick intro for our Pastor JP. Uh, pastor JP is the a pastor at Spectrum a lead pastor of Spectrum Church. And I'm sure we all know him because he's been a, connected to our church uh, many times and has spoke, I think has spoke of our church before previously as well. And Pastor Joey and Pastor JP are good friends. And today I have three things I wanted to share about Pastor JP to kind of, uh, Pastor JP to welcome him a little bit, to introduce him to us. Um, three things about Pastor JP that I really like and I've come to appreciate about him. Um, and these are things that he probably doesn't even know about. So some of them, but um, one thing, before I really got to know Pastor JP this last couple of weeks, um, I've heard about him from, of course, Pastor Joey, but it was also because he works with uh, my one of my mentors from seminary, one of my professors, Dr. Jeff Louie. So anybody that Dr. Jeff Louie works with, I think would be pretty awesome. So that's one reason. A uh, second reason was uh, his daughter, Carissa. Um, I've gotten to know Carissa and Carissa is an awesome sister in Christ, and she has a huge passion for mentoring. And she started this thing called the Parapateo Movement, which is for mentoring. And our, some of our church uh, brothers and sisters are partnering with other churches to mentor and, and guide some of these younger men and women, um, and in a sense, towards Christ and also in their lives. So it's really cool. And, you know, it's her dad. So it's awesome. And then the third thing, which is even cool, work random connection was that um, when I met with Pastor JP this week, um, he was wearing a shirt. It's a straight out of God's word. And of course, it's it's like a, it's kind of like straight out of Compton kind of reference, right, from a hip hop. So we kind of have a shared love for hip hop. And, and so those are the three things that I kind of was thinking about as I was like reflecting on how to intro um, Pastor JP. And so today, before I um, have him come and share the word of God with us, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the text that we're going to be looking at today, and then I'm going to pray for him, and then I'm going to have Pastor JP jump on and uh, preach the word to us. All right. So today, if you can, um, please stand for it. It's um, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 6 to 18. I'm going to read John chapter 17, verses 6 to 18, and this is the word of God. So that's why I asked you to stand. Well, obviously, I, I know we it was sitting there. Some of us are sitting, but it's a good to stand for his word, to take it seriously. So John chapter 17, verses 6 to 18. And Jesus is praying this. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I've given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I'm glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, or not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And it, do I go to verse 19? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. And this is the word of God. Um, let us pray. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, how rich and real it is. Thank you so much for this opportunity to hear your word preached. It's always a privilege to come and have access to your word in such freedom in this world today. Um, and Lord, I pray that today you would be with Pastor JP as he proclaims your truth. Lord, may you guide him, but you, you also prepare our hearts to receive this word. And especially the, the prayer of Jesus, how special these words are. We pray that it would stir in our hearts 
compassion for you and, and worshipfulness of you. And, and may you help us to receive it. Um, and may it be like a seed planted in good soil that would bear great fruit. So Lord, I, I lift up to you my brother JP, um, Pastor JP, and may you bless his preaching today. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Helicon, and hi, everyone. So good to see you all, some of you at least, and the other black screens, but I see your names. Uh, this is uh, my very first Zoom preaching. So uh, I appreciate some grace if I mess up or, you know, I'm just getting used to this thing. I'm not a very Zoom person, probably like many of you. I prefer seeing people face to face. So, and... Um, this is also the first time I'm using this awesome um, microphone that was gifted to me by Pastor Joey. So I'm excited to use it for the first time for your church. And uh, I'm just, he's going to be so happy to hear this. This has been sitting in my home for one year. And this is the first time it's found its way to be used. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited to be with you all. And as Pastor Helicon shared, you know, I'm so my daughter and he are much good friends and I'm just getting to know him. I keep hearing all awesome things about him from Joey and her and really hope to meet uh, him uh, in the future and face to face as well. And the last time I was with you guys, that's probably six months or more earlier, or maybe even a year before we, you know, I, I began sharing from the prayer of Jesus. Uh, from John chapter 17, the first five verses. And today I wanted to go to the second part of his prayer. I'm not sure if many of you may remember that. I'll try to highlight uh, as I go through the passage today, some of the things we touched on earlier as Christ Jesus brings it up again as well. But uh, this passage is the very first passage um, that spoke very deeply to me once I became a new Christian, and there was a book that was written by Martin Lloyd-Jones called Sanctified by the Truth. That was the very first book I read after I became a Christian, and it just spoke to me so much. And so it's a very personal passage to me as well. And it is sometimes called the high priestly prayer of Jesus, but what you really get to see is it reveals the heartbeat of Jesus. What does Jesus pray for? And one of the things that we see is not just what he prays for, but how Jesus prays. You know, in the very first verse of uh, this chapter, Jesus begins his prayer with the words, Father. And he uses that word three times throughout this passage. He says, Father in verse one, Holy Father in verse 11, and Righteous Father in verse 25. And, and that just shows the incredible loving relationship that he had with his father. You know, and Jesus, he had the perfect father. You know, some of us may not have had perfect fathers. I did not have a very good father and I even lost him when I was 15. That made me rebel against God and question his very existence. And for some of us, we've had dads who were either too harsh or who were very controlling. So it's hard when we pray to look at God as our father in a healthy way. But the fundamental premise for our prayers is looking to God as our father in Jesus Christ. You know, I know uh, Pastor Halikon knows Carissa, but we have two other kids and you guys probably know Brian and Sophie. I probably shared this last time too, is, uh, you know, they were foster kids in our home. And before I met them, uh, they came home, uh, you know, they, they loved us and they used to call me JP, you know. And the first time I saw Sophia, she came running down the stairs, said JP it was like love at first sight between a dad and daughter. But then once they came home and, uh, you know, they started settling down and one fine day they came to our bedroom, snug up and out of the blue, just called me daddy. That just, you know, messed me up because of my own you know, dysfunctional perceptions of what I thought was a father to see someone I realized that was the first time I earned being their father 
because they saw the love that they were experiencing. Since then, my name has morphed a lot. Now I get called Papa, Papi, Dada, and there are a few other names I can't share here, but that's just has brought us so closer and, and, the, and the nearness is just awesome. And, and, and I love it when you know, my daughter and my son call me in these awesome names. It just, and, and they do this, when they use these words when they want to get my special attention. And you know, that just reminds me of that's what prayer is. Now we should pray not because we should, but because we want. And because we trust that God is our perfect father. And, and we should pray not because we want something from our father, but because we want him and communion with him and union with him. That ought to be the essence of our prayer and nothing else. And so in the first part, Jesus prays this awesome prayer, reflecting back on his union with him. And you know, I'm doing a series in our church on union with Christ. And it is awesome because there are two things about our union with Christ. And Jesus talks about it in John 15. I am the wine and you are my branches. And you can do nothing without me. You know, because we are united to Christ, there are two aspects to it. One is we are united in Christ and Christ is in us. And because we are in Christ, we can go with Christ into God's presence and call him Abba Father. You know, before that, we never had that privilege. The Bible says we were enemies to God and, and, and we were destined to the wrath of God. And so when we looked at God, the, the relationship between us and God was more God as God the judge. But once Christ came between us and reconciled us to God, that relationship changed. And now God moves from being our judge to moves to being our loving father, which is a fantastic blessing that we have. And so Jesus begins his high priestly prayer. And guess what? Even now, as we are united to him, he is right now interceding for you and me as our sympathetic high priest. I know this year has been a very difficult year for us. It's been one of the most difficult year. It's a once in a century event that we are going through. It has tested our limits. It has broken hearts. We have lost loved ones. There's been pain, but there is nothing in all of the things that we experienced that Jesus did not experience himself while he was on earth. And since we are united to him, when we cry out, he is not crying out as someone who does not understand our pain. You know, when we were new foster kids, we, we and it, the whole thing was new to us and, and it was, very hard to know what are some things to do and how do we handle some challenges and and we got a support group of other foster adoptive parents and we used to so look forward to that because we knew when we go there these were people like you and me who understood the pain points of being a transitioning into this and we have those kind of support groups for so many things. When people are in pain, only those who are in pain like us can understand. And Jesus is that high priest. He has experienced it all for us. And so he begins his prayer, firstly, by praying for God's glory. That was the essence of the first part of his prayer. And now in the second part, he prays for his disciples. If it was glory that he prayed for, that God to be glorified in his first part. The second part, the emphasis that Jesus is praying for his disciples can be captured by one word, holiness. Holiness. You know, um, back in the 90s, a British anthropologist, Dr. Robin Dunbar, he came to an interesting conclusion he said humans could likely only maintain social relationships with an average of 148 individuals due to the size of our brain's neocortex or what's known as Dunbar's number. 
says more social information processing demands re de requires more cognitive resources and we only have so much brain power. That's why we even experience Zoom fatigue. This is not how our brain is wired to see people so close to face, you know, in, in one shot. So basically he says, we tend to top out at having about 150 meaningful relationships in our lives whether they are family or friends or acquaintances. So even if on Facebook, you have hundreds or thousands of friends, but a good chunk of them, if not most are out of our minds and probably Facebook uses these algorithms to suggest friends to us and stuff. But then on later on Dunbar's research led to the concept of Dunbar's layers, where the emotional closeness between individuals was taken into account. So this meant that our relationships looked more like layers instead of a cloud of 150 people. And the closest layer has three to five people. The next layer has 15 people, then 50 and so on. The inner layer is what Dunbar says makes up your vital friendships or your inner circle of close friends. These are people that you should have in your life to meet up with regularly, talk up personal matters and maintain a strong emotional connection. And I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the show Friends, where each main character, you know, Ross, Rachel, Joey, Phoebe, Monica and Chandler, these five people in their life, they're making it a pretty decent model to follow on a biological and social level. So he says, if you can ma manage to maintain three to five close friendships in the same way, you're far more likely to be content. And, and it's not just with friends. And, and, and I was looking at this and I'm like, Dunbar, actually, you know, it's already there in the Bible. You know, Jesus, he had so many followers, but he just picked 12 disciples. Within the 12, there were three who were closest to him. And even within the three, there was only one who he called as his beloved, you know. But here's what is fascinating is Jesus has picked these 12 disciples. These are his closest inner circle. And he wants to first and foremost pray for his friends. You know, the Lilly Endowment um, invested $84 million over 10 years to study and support practices that allow Christian pastors to sustain excellence and finish well. So they funded 63 projects across 25 denominations and traditions. And every single organization, they made a similar discovery that relationship with peers are the key factor to pastoral longevity. And I would extend this and say to all of us in whatever profession we are, and even going through this pandemic, some of you have probably seen this. They said those who have been regularly part of a community of faith and have had one or two vital connections are the ones who are doing much better than ones who don't. And this is what Jesus is praying for is for these friends, his disciples. You know, there's a great difference from your, our friends to what friendship looks like for us as Christians. You know, there's another word for friendship in Christianity. It's called disciples. We, and, and we want to make disciples. We want to make friends. But how cool if those we disciple are our friends and our close friends become disciples of Christ. And this is who and what we should be praying for. So Jesus seeks out the 12. He gives a glimpse of what he thought of these disciples and why he cares for them. And you know, what is the one thing Jesus prays for? He prays for holiness, sanctify them in the truth. Though he is going to die, he is praying for them. You know, why is it that sometimes when we pray, we find it hard to pray for others? Now just think of the last week and the times you spent in prayer. And how much of that was focused on praying for others? Or were they all just prayers for ourselves, focused on ourselves? What do we pray for others? You know, Jesus is looking at these 12 disciples. And remember, he knows they were all going to walk out on him. 
He is going to go through intense pain and suffering, but he's praying for one thing, which is holiness. You know, the best thing you can do for your friends is to pray for their holiness and your holiness. So what is holiness? You know, there are two aspects to holiness if we look at it comprehensively from the entire scriptures. Holiness is not just about doing sins or external acts. There are two aspects to it. Firstly, holiness or sanctify, you know, hagiatso, the word, the Greek word, refers to something that's separated from everything that can contaminate or pervert it. And in a second way, it refers to something that is singularly and wholly devoted to God. So there's a positive aspect of holiness and a negative aspect of holiness. Negatively, it is something that's separated from everything that can contaminate it. And positively, it is something that is holy and singularly devoted for God and his glory. And we see that used um, for several things in the entire Old Testament, from Mount Sinai to buildings to vessels and utensils and other things that were used in the tabernacle for worship, when they were set apart, they had to be in certain ways taken away. They cannot be used for common things. The vessels that were used for worship could not be used to serve meals. And the place where they entered to offer sacrifice had to be devoted to fit certain requirements. You know, um, all Navy SEALs must uh, attend and graduate from their 24 week A school. It's known as basic underwater demolition school or BUD school. So it's a basic parachutist course and, and a 26 week SEAL qualification training program. And if you have to get through this course for the Navy SEALs, they can't eat junk food. They have their body and mind needs to be in top shape and trained to not let the environment affect their performance so that they can get through this and come out and several of them drop out. You know, holiness is not something that happens by reminding ourselves, I don't wanna do this sin, I don't wanna do that sin, I don't wanna do that. But it happens by being fully focused on God and our union with Christ and letting that union, letting Christ in us to fully transform us from the inside out. So Jesus is play, praying for seven things and I wanna go through that real quick. From verse six, he says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you have, whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. I have manifested your name to the people. So Jesus says, God, make them holy as I have revealed you to them. You know, they, that's the job of a high priest. They were all very dysfunctional people, but he prays for them. He says, make them holy as I have revealed you to them. You know, holiness is not something that happens when we try to keep the law and try to have more laws and try to obey that with our own strength and to earn our way of acceptance before God and others. As long as we think I'm not good enough in God's sight and I have to do these things so that God can love me, we're never gonna reach that. As long as we are thinking, oh, I need to be good enough and smart enough and earn the appreciation from others, it's not gonna help that. Holiness happens from our union with Christ. When we fix our eyes upon Jesus, who he is, and Jesus, and that's what Jesus is praying for. He says, I have manifested your name to them. Help them fix their eyes upon you. And very graphically, we saw that with Jesus' episode with Peter when they were on this on uh, the lake of Galilee, Sea of Galilee, and Peter was, Jesus was asking Peter to walk towards him as he was walking towards them on water. 
And he tells Jesus, as long as you look at me, Peter, Jesus tells Peter, as long as you look at me, you're not going to sink. And the moment Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and looks at the storm, he goes down. Jesus specifically prays for Peter. You know, in Matthew 14, 28, he says, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the water and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got you into the boat, the wind ceased. And the, those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. You know, union with Christ is something that is intimately tied to our faith. Do we really believe that Jesus has taken away our punishment on the cross and has given us and clothed us with his righteousness so we can enter into God's presence? And therefore, when Peter gets it, he says in 1 Peter 1.13, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The more we gaze upon Jesus and know that he has finished it all for us and I'm incredibly loved. I don't have to perform. I don't have to act out to get God's attention or the attention of the world and enjoy that grace that we have in Christ. And as the Holy Spirit helps us to connect with this Jesus, the more we gaze upon him, the more we see him and God through him and realize we don't need anything else is when we can experience holiness, is when we can practice forgiveness. You know, if we are having a problem with your friend, as you think of your friends and we have conflicts and as people, broken people, we are going to fail each other all the time. But every time someone fails us, if we are going to walk away, if we are unable to forgive them, it's probably because we haven't experienced this forgiveness of Christ. We're not looking at Christ. You know, when we look at Jesus and see, as Peter says, when he was reviled, he reviled not in return. If I don't see God as a forgiving God, then I will not be able to practice that forgiveness. You know, holiness is not about doing a particular sin. It's not being fully focused on God. It's not being fully focused on enjoying our union with Christ. So prayer, therefore, helps us to refocus on God. And Jesus, as our high priest, when we pray, he prays with us. He reveals God to us in a way that frees us from things that hold us down. Secondly, he prays. Make them holy as they are yours. Now, God does not make us holy because we work hard, but because we are his. Again, you know, there's a difference between foster care and adoption. You know, when you're in foster care, children are just given care. There's nothing much. They're, they're still technically not your kids. And the first six months, Brian and Sophia were with us, they would have nightmares. They'd be afraid because when he was small, Brian uh, is a heavy boy, you know, uh, as a one year old, there was an old grandma who was fostering him and she didn't have the strength. So every time she picked him, she kept dropping him down. And so when he came home and he was two years old, when we grab him, he just grabbed my shirt and he wouldn't even let me grab him up because he's all the time afraid that they're going to drop him that he's going to fall down and his head will hurt. Never felt safe. He never felt he belongs to us. But once the adoption happened, 
We went to court, we signed the papers and the judge declared, this is your son and daughter. And they came home and, and after they started connecting with us, when they knew that we are ours and nothing is going to separate us, his trust began to grow. Slowly he started climbing on me. And I remember the first moment we went out on a trip and, and there was these two twin beds and he was sleeping and he woke up and I was here and I said, Brian, do you want to jump? And he did. And I have a slow-mo video of that. I keep going back to it again and again and again. He was flying in the air. He just threw his hands because he knew his daddy is going to catch him. And this time he's not going to fall. That was, and still is, one of the most awesome moments when I think about that. And he now looks at me as I preach and he says he wants to be a pastor when he grows up. <laughs> when we know we are precious to our Father in Christ, that will want us to become like him. That will want us, I want to be like my daddy. I want to be like God. I want to be... It's not a rule-based chore. It comes out of love when we know and taste and see how good our God is. Prayer reminds us of how precious we are. Verse 7, he says, Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. The third thing Jesus prays is <clears throat> make them holy as I have given your word and truth. Make them holy as I have given your word to them and they know the truth. Holiness doesn't happen in a vacuum. Holiness is intimately tied and connected with God's word for us. And that's why it is imperative for us to get into God's word, without which we cannot understand who God is, we cannot understand who we are, and we will keep going back to our own ways and our own things. And it is the truth that sets us free and therein is the need for us to be engaged in God's word. And, and as you re spend this time in God's word diligently, and when we pray, he takes those words and applies it to our hearts. You know, um, there's a poet in for, uh, an artist and, and uh, photographer who said this quote, um, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up to work. You know, holiness is not a one-time fire coming from heaven and making us, purging us and becoming like an angel. It is through this monotonous, simple, daily task of reading his word and praying one day at a time, one step at a time. It is through that we grow in our holiness. If you're going to sit and wait for some exhilarating experiences, it's not going to happen. You know, the poet, what he means by saying inspiration is for amateurs is even though he is so skilled and so creative, some of the best people in all the sports they show up and do go to work. And I'm not a big Lakers fan. I'm a Warriors fan, but I do have a lot of respect for Kobe. And uh, I've seen videos and, and heard interviews of Kobe and now even Steph Curry. Uh, if you watched them, like recently, Steph Curry nailed, what is that, some 350 three-pointers straight up. And... Oh, no, 348 out of 350 or something. And Kobe would practice his step back jumpers like a zillion times. They used to say he'll be the first one to show up 
for practice before the pre-game. And, and, and I remember one, he said, when he went to, um, when they were on the road and visiting a road team, he sa said he wanted to go at 4 a.m. or some crazy time before he said, because I want my opponent to see that I'm putting in the work. Legends don't get made because they have extraordinary talent, even though they have extraordinary talent, when they have to nail that shot during the game, it comes because they have practiced it a zillion times before. So why would we expect holiness to just happen? But it happens when we do these basic things of getting ourselves into his word and spending time in prayer. And I'll tell you in a minute what that can do for us and how this holiness blossoms in our self. When we do this prayer applies truth from God's word in the areas of our lives that need his touch. And the next point is going to highlight that the fourth point, verse nine and 10, he says, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. Jesus says, make them holy as I am glorified in them. And here he ties the first part of his prayer with this. He says, he ties his glory with our holiness. You know, if you remember, I spoke about what the, what the word glory means. You know, the word glory, just to refresh our memories from the Hebrew word is kavod, which means weightiness. When we say the glory of God, it is what makes God so weighty. What are some things about God that make him to be so weighty? And for us, when we think of ourselves, there are things, we, we basically are people who are by default seeking our own glory. If we ask what makes me, a, give me, gives me my significance, for most of us, it could be our work, our success, our money, our relationships, or how people perceive us. That's what, it's basically what you're thinking about when you have nothing else to think about. That's your weightiness. That's our glory. Whereas what makes God significant or weighty are all his attributes and his holiness. And what Jesus is saying is, is when we pray together with him, God is going to take our weightiness away and transplant that with God's weightiness in our heart. So what we have been focused and pursuing as what gives us our significance is going to disappear and what makes God significant and his holiness and his characteristics are going to be infused in us when we spend time in prayer. That's what Jesus is praying about. God, I want you, I want your glory to shine through these 12 disciples of mine. And it did even to the point of death, because every single one of them were martyred. As God makes us holy by looking at him, by separating us, by reflecting his characteristics, Christ gets glorified. His weightiness begins to shine more. Our weightiness is replaced by his weightiness. You know, Martin Lloyd-Jones from that book I told you about that I read, he defines sanctification as this. He says, sanctification ultimately means being like God, sharing the life of God, being in the right relationship with God, and having, per having perfect communion with him. Prayer helps us see the glory of God through Christ. And fifth point, he says, verse 11, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. He says, make them holy by keeping them together. You know, holiness is not an isolated act. We need one another to grow in holiness. He says, make them one as we are one. You know, perfect love exists within the Trinity. The Father is fully present in the Son. And the Son is fully present in the Father. 
And the Holy Spirit is fully, he, when Jesus was on earth, when it came on him, it fully was present entirely in Christ's being. There is no space that exists where any one of the Trinity are not there. That's the communion that they have. And Jesus is saying, I want that same communion unity to be reflected with us. So if we need to ask ourselves, how deep are our friendships? If it's just superficial friendships, or if someone hurts us and we back off, you know, as Asians, we are famous for maintaining this face saving culture. We, we, we don't deal with conflicts well, we freeze or we fight or we flee. And, and we, 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 there, there becomes this disconnect. But true love is speaking the truth in love. Friendship is hard. When someone wrongs us, don't quit, don't walk away. Because we, it is through those things God makes us holy. And we need one another to keep us focused on God. Pray for those who hurt you. And God will show us what we have done in that and bring us together. Sixth point, he says, make them holy by protecting them from the evil one. And then he talks of Satan and how he's waiting to devour us. But you know how we can let Satan get into our relationships and affect our holiness? You know, it says, do not let the sun go down in your anger and give Satan a foothold. It's when we have conflicts and strains and relationships, and if we don't resolve them in a godly manner, we are giving Satan a foothold. And he will come and he will destroy friendships. He will destroy marriages. He will bring disunity among leaders and churches. And that's the reason we need prayer. When we pray, God is going to show us these things and move us to resolve. And lastly, he says, in verses 16 to 19, he says, make them holy by my sanctification. Verse 19, he says, for, and for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Jesus did not need sanctification. It means separation. What did Jesus separate himself from? You know, the ultimate reason and plea he's making is make them holy by separating me from you. What an awesome prayer. He says, Father, they are going to die unless I pay the debt. Therefore, I separate myself from you so that they may be separate, so they, they may not be separated from you. I will be cut off. You can pour out your wrath in my heart. I will be separated and cast out so they can be brought in. That is the awesome work that Jesus did. He's not only our high priest, he was also our sacrifice who separated himself from God the Father from this perfect union. The only one place where that was broken was on the cross when he said, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? And he did that so we can be united to God. And, and his holiness can be imparted, not just imputed to us, as his righteousness, but imparted to us. And he's going to do that by dwelling in our hearts and helping us to pray even when we can't pray, when we cry out, that is Christ living in us and making our prayers heard in God's presence as him being in the right hand of God, pleading for you and me as our high priest. And as Isaac Watts says, love so amazing, so, di so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. What an incredible prayer it is, my friends. And I pray that God will bless these words for us, that we will pray this prayer for ourselves and our friends. And we will pray that if there is someone that we don't have a good relationship with right now, that God will bring them to our mind and we'll seek to restore that. And that we will spend time in his word and seek to let the glory and weightiness of God and his holiness replace what we have been pursuing that is hindering our holiness, hindering us from being separated, that he will enable us to separate those things that are pulling us down and have our eyes fixed upon you.
And if we do that, that will bless us and those of our friends that he has given us. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for praying for us. Thank you that you're still praying this prayer for us right now. Just like your disciples, we need that holiness. We want to be sanctified in your truth. Not just alone, but as a community, as a group of friends. So I pray, Lord, that you will enable us to experience more and more of this by drawing us more and more to yourself every day. Pray for my dear brothers and sisters here. The pandemic has made it hard for us to stay connected. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us in these moments to restore friendships that have been lost or broken. That we will deepen friendships that we already have. That we will pray not just for our holiness, but for the holiness of our dear friends and brothers, so that as a community, as a body, as a church, we may reflect your holiness to those around us, to a world that desperately needs you. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Um.